welcome everyone to the second of the talks in our Autumn Invisible History series. We especially welcome our speaker, Frank Palmieri, who has researched at our library, but is coming to us today from Florida, where he is Emeritus Professor of English at the University of Miami. His title is Thomas Spence, Satirist, Utopian, Socialist. Many thanks, Frank. Over to you. Thank you very much, Lynette, and thank you to the library for giving me this opportunity. I've really enjoyed and profited from the work that I've been able to do at the wonderful collection and with the wonderful people at the WCML. Thank you all for being here. Let me, uh, at this point, move to the PowerPoint, and I will just do that. I think, can you all see my title page? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Frank. Yes? Yeah. Okay. And then I'll just uh, get going. Uh, thank you to, to Felix, my very helpful IT person. Oh, okay. So today I'm going to be talking about Thomas Spence's political satire. And And I'm going to conclude with some reflections on his relation to William Morris. But first, uh, I'd like to place Spence in the larger argument I'm developing um, in an earlier work and then in the book that I'm working on now concerning the history of satire in the 18th and 19th centuries. In my book, Satire History Novel from 2003, I argued that satire, after serving as the dominant form of literary and cultural expression in England in the early 18th century, was gradually displaced from its position of preeminence by historical nar narratives and forms of the novel. Taking a long view of this succession of dominant genres, the book traced the movement from Swift's satires through the histories of Hume to Scott's historical novels although it also noted that women writers lacking access to the emergent dominant political public sphere continued to find it useful and necessary to use the genre of satire in their narratives. My current project, originally conceived as a continuation of satire history in the novel for the 19th century, and now titled The Disciplining and Return of Radical Political Satire in 19th Century England, reconsiders the 1790s in its first chapter, taking a more fine-grained view of the continuation of the satiric tradition from the earlier 18th century in political writings by women as well as by working men in the newly emerging plebeian public sphere, which was vibrant in the early and mid 1790s, but also precarious. As examples of such energy in the working class public sphere, we could cite two radical weeklies which were published in London from late 1793 to early 1795 that responded in their titles and substance to Burke's characterization of the common people as a quote, swinish multitude. Both serials reappropriated the porcine epithet and reevaluated it as their own. Thomas Spence wrote, edited, and printed Pig's Meat. Uh, with the title page here, and Daniel Isaac Eaton filled the same roles in producing his Politics for the People or a Salmagundi for Swine, Salmagundi meaning a stew or an oleo. Spence's journal sold for a penny an issue, Eaton's for two pennies. They were thus well within reach of artisans and working men, especially considering that there would have been multiple readers of most copies. Both publications also took the form of a miscellany, placing excerpts from writers such as Godwin and Locke alongside the editor's political reflections, satiric pieces, and new song lyrics. Spence's serial was the more consistently philosophical, and as you've heard, I'm going to concentrate on it here. In all his work, Spence advanced a central idea formulated by the time he was 25, and repeated in different forms in his subsequent writings. His key idea was that since the possession of landed property was the source of most inequities, land should not be owned by individuals. 
Neither, though, he believed, should it be held by the nation. Rather, it should be in the possession of each parish and managed by an elected council. The only tax paid by anyone in Spence's society would be the annual rent paid to the parish for the household's use of the land and buildings. Of the sum of these rents that went to the parish, most would be employed by the parish council in repairing and building roads, bridges, schools, and other public goods. A small portion of the total would go to a skeletal national government, mostly for defense. The remainder would be returned to the households, divided equally, that is, these, uh, house, the, the amounts that were given to households would be divided equally among all of the individuals of whatever age who had lived within the parish for a year or more. Movable property, on the other hand, could be owned, sold, and bequeathed. Throughout his career as a writer, Spence adopted many forms, the Robinsonad, dialogue, satire, utopia. But the essential idea remained the same over 35 years with only minor changes. For example, in his first formulation, leases on land extended for an indefinite period. In later versions, he limited a household's lease to seven years to ensure that a family would not become too attached to a house and property. The importance of satire in Spence's writings has not previously been noted, although Marcus Wood has well analyzed the use of his satire in another medium, in the medals that Spence struck at various points throughout his career. And here I'd just like to briefly show you um, a series of five of them. The first one is an advertisement for Spence's pig's meat uh, from 1793. You can see that it uh, centrally features uh, a pig or boar with the title of the publication coming out of his mouth as the pig uh, has under his feet a bishop's mitre and a crown of royalty. The second one is entitled End of Pain. Um, and I should explain that although you can't quite see it, pain is spelled without the E, but there's definitely a pun on the possibility that pain would be hanged. Uh, but the, oh, the, the dominant um, meaning of the coin is that this execution uh, by hanging might be the end of our earthly pain, according to the, you know, in the, in the time of the 1790s, with the steeple of the church in the background implying that the established church sanctions such punishments. On the back, as I'll refer to later, Spence to indicate, uh, to give you an idea of how he saw himself, he includes in the circle around the outside in the circumference, he says, enemies of tyranny, and then he has three names, Thomas More, Thomas Paine, and Thomas Spence. Here's a uh, variation on that representation of a gibbeted man. This is the end of P with the rebus for the I, T obviously meaning that it represents the hanging of Pitt or the desired hanging of Pitt. Um, with, in this case, uh, leg irons underneath his feet um, coming out of use and the hangman's ax. Uh, he stamped his coin sometimes um, not on coins of his own uh, minting, but on uh, very small uh, um, dominations, uh, denominations. So for example, farthings. This one um, has the unambiguous uh, uh, reading, no landlords, you fools, Spence's plan forever, right? That's his, um, his message. And finally, this again is one of his own uh, designs. I don't know why it's a cat in the middle that's represented as being free except that cats are notoriously difficult to discipline. Uh, but reading from noon or midnight, I among slaves enjoy my freedom is his statement of his own 
uh, position of independence. Right? So that gives you some idea of his um, of his self presentation. Um, he gave most of these coin, most of these medals away as advertisements, and um, the rest, I think, were, cap were could be just picked up from his from his shop. He was a bookseller, a publisher, um, as well as an author. Satire informed Spence's writing in numerous interlocking ways, which I'll go through in this talk, through his violent indignation, his subversive biblical references, and his sharp use of irony and parody. Spence usually adopts the tone of a moderate man in his writings, a man who is making common sense observations in conversation with an equal. But when he discusses large landowners, his language sometimes flashes out in passages of extreme and graphic violence. As an example, in a further account of Spensonia, his utopian um, location for the realization of his ideals from 1749, the Spensonian engages in a dialogue with the visitor uh, uh, and proposes seeing romance giants and their castles as figures for the great aristocrats of his own day. He proposes understanding, quote, the stories of enormous and tyrannical giants as disguised truths and as just satires upon great lords. For if those fabulous monsters were said to eat the people and their children, your real monsters of landlords really eat their meat, reducing them to such misery that eating their bodies as the giants did would be much more beneficent. Spence here turns timeless romance to topical satire, reading imaginary cannibalistic ogres as allegories of the very real predatory landowners of his own time. In doing so, he echoes Swift's modest proposal from 1729, where the narrator suggests that the Irish Catholics already having their livelihoods and substance consumed by absentee Anglo-Irish landlords would be better off if they could sell their infants to the English as a culinary delicacy like veal. The accusation of cannibalism surfaces again in the rights of infants when one woman among many who have taken on the role of revolutionaries from what they called their useless, quote, lock-jawed spouses and paramours because they don't speak up, one of these women prophesies to the aristocrats that the time of reckoning will come soon. She says, ye oppressors, ye who live sumptuously, your horrid tyranny, your infanticide is, ended, is at an end, your grinding of the faces of the poor and your drinking of the blood of infants is at an end. As Spence echoes by, indicates by echoing Paine's rights of man in the title of this work, his woman asserts the supposedly uncontroversial rights of infants not to have their blood drunk by the owners of property. And another strategy, which at times makes use of violent imagery, as in the restorer of society to its natural state from 1801, Spence employs notorious biblical characters in his indictment of landowners. In one such passage, he reminds readers that with the silver Judas gained through his act of betrayal, he purchased land known as the field of blood, as is written in Acts 1. Spence also cites Ahab and Jezebel as corrupt monopolists who appropriated, misappropriated land and money. Having laid the foundation, he then disclaims against modern monopolizers of every description, including villainous ministers, citizen killing generals and admirals with all the tribe of nabobs and slave traders from the East and West Indies, each coming with the reward of iniquity in his hand to buy a field of blood. You can see him indicting not only the landlords, landlords for owning land, but for having obtained their land through slavery and through imperialism. In other passages, he reverses the traditional judgment of biblical figures. In the previous one, Ahab and Jezebel were already villains and he keeps them that way. 
In this next one, he's going to reverse the normal judgment of a heroic biblical figure. Here, he recommends against half measures, which he claims will be futile in dealing with landowners whom he complains, who he compares to Samson. And he says, anything short of total destruction of the power of these Samsons will not do. No, we must scalp them or else they will soon recover and pull our temple of liberty about our ears. The notion that landlords must be scalped and utterly wiped out in order to restore justice in society inverts many cultural and biblical conventions. In the first place, Spence identifies the landless agents of justice with indigenous people who also refused to conceive of private property and land and who are also associated with scalping, although as we now recognize, European Americans also engaged in the practice, and as Spence probably knew also. Similarly, in arguing that the landowners must be scalped and killed because like Samson's, their strength will return if they are left any land, Spence aligns himself with the Philistines and against the Israelite hero, and he identifies the temple of English liberty that he exhorts his readers to preserve with the temple of the Philistines that Samson, the hero, brought down. By advocating the, quote, extermination of landholders who will not surrender their claims to the land, Spence supports killing those whom their culture regards as the highest and most civilized members of the community. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, in his discourse on inequality, had argued that the first man who, having enclosed a piece of ground, to whom it occurred to say, this is mine, and found people sufficiently simple to believe him was the founder of civil society and the source of how many crimes, wars, murders, miseries, and horrors. Like Rousseau, Spence regards private property and land as the foundation of artificial inequality in society and considers the civilization built on such a basis to be unjust and immoral. The challenge to the value of civilization constitutes another of Spence's strategies for satirizing a society. At the conclusion of a dialogue between the author and a gentleman following Spence's Rights of Man in 1793, he uses the same title as Payne, uh, the year after Payne's second part of Rights of Man. The author explains that he came to his view after seeing the difficulties his poor parents had in attempting to provide for a numerous family, although they were hardworking and frugal. When he began to read, he says, he found that, quote, the savages in Greenland, America, and at the Cape of Good Hope could all, by their hunting and fishing, procure subsistence for their families. He provides a brief conjectural history of the early stages of social life to show that people did not leave the savage stage voluntarily, in order to obtain the benefits of civilization. People, he believes, would not leave a state in which they could find their own subsistence in order to enter one in which they would have to pay rent and taxes and still starve. Therefore, those who are, landlo who are landless must have left a pastoral state because they were compelled to do so, most probably by conquest. Quote, savages may sometimes suffer want, he contends, but the poor tamed wretch drags on a despicable, miserable, and toilsome existence from generation to generation. As I've indicated in my previous book, State of Nature, Stages of Society, which is on conjectural history in the 18th and 19th centuries, most conjectural histories of the second half of the 18th century trace the advancement of human communities through stages, from savagery through barbarism to commercial society. However, following, following Rousseau's lead, Spence inverts this narrative, arguing that humans have regressed from a savage, from a savage state of liberty and self-sufficiency to a tame state of dependence and want because the strongest and most unscrupulous seized land and introduced into the world, quote, all the cursed varieties of civilized society, especially, quote, lordship, vassalage, and slavery. In the Restorer of Society, 
Spence introduces yet another biblical reference, although a very obscure one, to illustrate this point about the injustice of civilized life. He praises the Rechabites, a family of Israelites who rejected the corruption and luxury of the court of Ahab and Jezebel and returned to a simpler pastoral mode, living in tents, engaging in no agriculture, and drinking no wine. For these practices, they were honored by the prophet Jeremiah. Although Rousseau saw civilization as a source of corruption, he considered a return to a pastoral way of life to be impractical. The Rechabites went much further than Rousseau in returning to pastoralism, for which they approved the approval of Jeremiah. In a final strategy, Spence uses satire, uses irony and parody to satirize the system of landed property. In 1795, in the immediate aftermath of the treason trials under Pitt, he wrote a formal recantation and published a formal recantation of the, of the proposals he had advanced in the end of oppression. The following introductory passage gives a good example of the sustained ironic inversions that characterized the piece. So here he says, whereas I have foolishly let it down as a fundamental that the earth belongs at all time to the living inhabitants and that mankind come into the world with as clear a title to eat grass and subsist on the produce of the earth as any other class of reptiles or creatures whatever to the great alarming of the landed interest. I being now deeply concerned for the peace of every gentleman and lady do most solemnly for myself and for the whole plebeian race of mankind, renounce and give up all claims to this world, to its soil, and every product thereof for all time present and forever. Calling his own distinctive foundational principle foolish, Spence takes the position here of appearing to accept the dominant though unacknowledged belief that all humans do not have the same right as snakes or cows to eat the product of the earth, even grass. And he supposedly renounces all his former claims of rights to land and food out of a concern for the delicate sensitivities of the aristocrats and other landowners, landholders. In addition, he later asks, what would happen, this is in his recantation, what would happen if the land were placed in the hands of the common people? He responds in the voice of the landholders that they would sh that the people would surely not have enough intelligence to collect rents, nor would they think of dividing the land among themselves. And if they did, that would only mean that, quote, the idle, I mean, the poor would be claiming as large dividends as the more wealthy, and that would be insufferable. So the ironic method of this recantation makes Spence's points by saying openly what the system's defenders usually only say under their breaths or in private, such as that the poor are all lazy and stupid. The need to read by contraries to decode the meaning of the piece strengthens its satiric effect. The recantation as a whole functions as a parody of a recantation by drawing attention to the hypocritical self-satisfaction of his landholding opponents. Spence demonstrates that he does not in fact renounce any of his principles. Spence parodies another form effectively in his speech in his own defense against the charge of seditious libel in 1803, which he later published. First, he points out that the proceeding is stacked against him from the start. He begins by noting what he calls a seeming hardship. These are my italics in this quotation seeming hardship that I should be tried by men of property concerning a work, the sole object of which is to now modify property in such a manner that many of you gentlemen, that is gentlemen of the jury whom he's addressing, may consider yourselves as highly concerned and interested in the decision. The statement shows Spence to be a master of dry understatement. It does seem a bit unfair that he's being tried by a jury of landowners for proposing the elimination of private land ownership. I wonder how they're going to decide. In addition to this ironic point, Spence parodically inverts the conventions of the defendant's speech in his own defense. By explaining his reasoning in the indicted pamphlet, The Restorer of Society, he maintains that his purpose will appear not only innocent or neutral, 
but praiseworthy, presenting himself not as a mere bookseller, his phrasing, or as a partisan hack. He identifies himself as a, quote, an original legislature, uh, an original legislator for having formed the most compact system of society on the immovable basis of nature and justice. Spence elevates him here to himself here to the status of a lawgiver of world historical importance, the discoverer and promoter of a political system that could usher in a utopian era of peace, stability, and justice. Later in his self-defense, he compares himself to the greatest political thinkers in the Western tradition, some of them utopians, many of them Republicans, the utopian Plato, Aristotle, whom he reads as a Democrat, Livy, a Roman Republican, Machiavelli, a theorist of Republicanism in his discourses on Livy, Locke, theorist of the English Revolution of 1688-89, and finally James Harrington, author of the Utopian Republic, described in Oceana of 1656, published, of course, during the Commonwealth, and originator of the thesis that political power follows property. In other words, Spence suggests that he deserves not to be punished as a seditionist, but rewarded for his writings as a benefactor of mankind. Rather than merely pleading not guilty to the charge against him, he puts the court itself on trial, opposing to its injustice, the, the justice that could prevail under the political system he has promoted peacefully for 25 years. In thus inverting the genre of the speech of self-defense, the defendant becoming the prosecutor, the court, the accused, Spence repeats the course of action of yet another major political thinker in the Western tradition. According to Plato's Apology, when Socrates was on trial for corrupting Athenian youth, he did not follow the conventions that he was expected to and beg for his life, a course that might have led to his being pitied as an old man and acquitted by the jury. Instead, he argued that the city should reward him with free meals for the rest of his life as a benefactor of the state because of his practice of encouraging both old and young to question established traditional knowledge. Spence directly echoes Socrates when he says, I think, gentlemen, instead of prosecuting people for, promoting, for proposing plans of human happiness, those rather should be prosecuted who keep such things back. What resulted from the refusal to repent and conform in the cases of both Spence and Socrates was conviction and punishment. The sentence in Socrates' case was death. In Spence's case, it was a year in prison, but prison in extremely poor conditions, like those which led to Harrington's own physical and mental deterioration when he was imprisoned for his republicanism after the restoration. It is revealing that a number of utopian writers figure among the political theorists whose work, uh, by his own account, Spence, uh, parallels Spence's. It is also worth remembering that utopia is the other side of strong political satire. I mentioned Spence's reference to Moore earlier on one of his medals. In Thomas More's genre defining utopia, the first half of the reported conversation with the sailor Raphael Hithlodius draws a devastating picture of Henry VIII's England. Land enclosures took land away from common use in order to enable large landholders to replace subsistence agricultural workers with grazing sheep and to sell their wool on the international market. Such enclosures and forced displacements produced tens of thousands of unemployed vagrants each year. And it was no coincidence that the state executed by hanging more than 100,000 men each year during Henry VIII's reign for vagrancy and petty theft, for having nowhere to go and no place to work. In this England, the proper relation between men and sheep is reversed. Instead of men eating sheep, here in a darkly satiric formulation, Morris says, sheep eat men. It is in contrast with this upside down state that Hithlodius presents his account of the ideal state founded on the absence of private property. Spence develops his idea for this utopian society in a number of, of his works, including the Constitution of a Perfect Commonwealth and the Constitution of Spensonia. In the preface to the Perfect Commonwealth, 
he summarizes the advantages of his proposal uh, of his proposed constitution for each class in the state, not only the laboring class. When he comes to the laborers, containing the large majority of the people, he projects that the elimination of taxes will lower the price of every item they purchase. Moreover, the distribution of rents above what is needed for government each year will provide additional income. In this system, Spence says, laborers and their families would be enabled now and then to be hospitable to one another, to entertain a friend, to relax a little now and then from incessant labor, to appear clean and decent in apparel and comfortable in their habitations, to educate their children, and in a word, to be respectable and happy citizens. Such prospects for a majority of the population may seem quite modest for utopian vision, although we can contrast them with the images of cannibalism and blood drinking that Spence used in his satires of the landholders in the earlier works that I was quoting from. But by contrast with the reality of industrializing England, a life of cleanliness, decency, and respectability, including the ability to entertain a friend or two and to see one's children educated takes shape as an almost unattainable dream. Spence also compares his utopian vision with millenarian promises in the Bible, of which he quotes more than half a dozen in The Important Trial. Speaking of the coming of, I'm quoting now these in turn, new heaven and new earth, when governors and people shall live in peace and amity, when the people shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble. And he asks if it would not be better to ban the Bible than to allow poor people to be deluded by dreams of a new Jerusalem, where, quote, there is to be no sorrow. If the wealthy property owners are going to silence him for proposing a more just form of society, they should suppress the Bible as well, because its visions of a more just and happy social state inspired his own. Almost 100 years after Spence's writings, William Morris published News from Nowhere, a utopian socialist vision which in some respects closely resembles Spence's. Like Spence, Morris was both the author of this work and in effect its publisher through his financial support for the journal Commonweal, Commonweal where it first appeared, the publication of the Social Democratic Federation. Comparing Spence's thought and Morris's on which I would like to spend the remainder of my time, shows Morris extending ideas that Spence had proposed. No doubt this pattern results in part from the different times in which the two works were written. When Spence wrote, the large majority of the population were still agricultural workers, and he presumes that society will continue. By contrast, Morris writing in late 19th century industrial England condemned the ugliness and pollution as well as the dehumanization of industrial workers. Morris's utopian society recognizes no form of private property, neither movable goods, nor land, nor buildings. Neither do the inhabitants of nowhere use money. The people of 2100 or so react with embarrassment when their visitor, guest, tries to pay with coins for goods or services they provide. Spence, on the other hand, does not propose the abolition of movable private property property, nor the nationalization of landed property, but instead administration of landed property by local councils. Morris also emphasizes local control of decision making, but is silent on the way that individual preferences for labor align with or are made to fit the need for labor on various projects. For example, the labor intensive haymaking to which guests and his new friends in nowhere had as they row up the Thames in the final third of the work. Spence conceives that his utopians will still be able to engage in trade, accumulate possessions, and pass along modest fortunes by inheritance, except in land. His whole system, in fact, depends on the rents that each householder must pay to the parish. Each person 20 years of age and older has a vote for their parish council, and each parish or group of parishes votes for one of the 1,000 members of the National Assembly. Rather than retaining these rudiments of an electoral system and a representative government, Morris is nowhere as a product of his philosophical anarchism. It has no national or local government and no elected representatives. Instead, members of a community meet, 
to discuss a proposed course of action, such as draining a wetland or building a bridge, and they embark on an initiative only once a consensus has been reached. When Guest asks in chapter 13, before he hears about this system, he asks how they manage politics in nowhere. The response makes that chapter the most pithy and most satiric in the book. The old man who is his interlocutor responds that they manage just fine for politics because they have none. The old party politics was only a shadow boxing between two factions of the wealthy ruling class. In nowhere, the people themselves debate and decide what needs to be done or they decide, decide not to do it. This withering away of a representative democracy accounts for one of the strongest satiric details in Morris's work. Although the Norwarians have allowed meadows and trees to replace most of the buildings in 19th century London, they have let stand the Houses of Parliament, which Morris regarded as irremediably ugly. However, the function of those landmarks has changed in his utopia, and they now serve as vast storehouses for manure. Morris also critiques narrative forms, as Spence inverted the accepted interpretations of biblical figures such as Samson, and parodied forms such as the recantation. However, Morris satirically interrogates the distinctive and authoritative secular form of 19th century England, the realistic novel. In nowhere, more than one character passes harsh judgment on the narrowness of Victorian novels, which concerns themselves with, find, with finding a way for a comfortably middle-class young man and woman to marry on the last page and live the rest of their lives in idleness. Such narratives were fantasies of escape from the conditions of life for the millions of subsistence level wage workers in Victorian society. The author of the Utopia, Morris's Utopia, clearly implies that his work is not as escapist as a novel. It is a romance, as its subtitle says, of a period of rest, a vision, and even as the author says on the last page, if he can bring enough people to conceive of the society of the future as he sees it, it is even a prophecy. Thus, these two authors use the romance genre to undermine the conventional wisdom and belief of their culture in the inevitability of private property and money. Spence appears to accept the romance tradition when he refers to ogres who eat the children of the poor, and he, when he uses allegory to point to these ogres in contemporary society. But the identification of propertyed aristocrats and members of parliament with blood, drink, blood drinking monsters is too shockingly close to the truth to be dismissed as a backward looking use of a medieval form. It is realistic in branding the most respected large property owners as essentially morally cannibals. For his part, Morris shows that the realistic novel is a wish fulfillment, as a fantasy of a rise into or consolidation of one's place in the middle class, the 19th century novel proves to be the true romance, whereas Morris's own utopian romance proves to be the more forward-looking, less bound to 19th century mystifications of property and capital. These considerations return us to the matters of genre with which I began this talk. In the 1790s, Spence uses social satire to critique the historical injustices of property in his day. After that, and this is the argument of the book that I'm now working on, after the 1790s, radical satire endures an almost century long campaign of suppression or disciplining. Then in the late 19th century, by the late 1880s, by around 1890, satiric form as autonomous form reemerges, for example, in Morris's Socialist Utopia, but also, to give you an idea of what I'm thinking of, in H.G. Wells's famous scientific romances. Um, satiric form reemerges to critique the injustices endured by labor and the romantic fantasies of the novel at the later date. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. I will get us back to uh, being able to see everybody. And I have to say that I, I just kept the savagery of some of the satire 
just felt horribly apposite on the day in the UK when uh, some of the very poorest in our society are, are um, having £20 a week taken away from them in universal credit. Just kind of... <laughs> anyway. Um, no, no, if, I could, if I could just break in, I mean, it requires... Yeah. Some dis it required some discipline on my part not to make contemporary applications <laughs> over and over again here, but I think that you could all see them. Yeah. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. I'm less I'm less subtle than you, Frank. Too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We are we are getting so ah Stuart has got his hand up, so I'm going to ask him to unmute first. But please, sort of be be thinking of questions and comments, Stuart. Um, yeah, I, I, I only I only live a few miles away from um, the Literary and Philosophical Institute, where Thomas Spence was famously expelled mm -hmm. for his um, uh, his arguments um, in but, Newcastle. In Newcastle, well, yes, yes, Newcastle, basically. Um, but what what I'd like to question you is, um, I mean. I, I greatly admire uh, Thomas Spence and, uh, and and other exponents of a deeply critical, vociferous, scorching rhetoric. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and but what 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 I've, I I've certainly experienced it for for quite a number of years and increasingly so, is that kind of approach, satire and the rest of it. Um, uh, is almost challenged to some extent by many people, particularly influenced by the uh, fe feminist movement, who basically sort of like argue uh, for, uh, th that one shouldn't ha be so confrontational with things that you disagree with, and that you should seek to engage and converse, and that there is a, a scope for some kind of meeting of minds if you actually exchange opinions and so forth, um, which is like in absolute contradiction to Thomas Spence and, and, and others. Uh, uh, but uh, how to put it, people passionately and sincerely believe that one shouldn't be as confrontational to what one sees as things that are, need to be changed as Thomas Spence and, and those that followed in his wake. And I wondered how you how you see this kind of cultural change. Um, yeah, I've worked on satire for most of my career. My first two books were on satire and the changing fortunes of satire. And so the second book, for example, which is the predecessor to the one that I'm working on now, um, concerns, as I as I mentioned, the kind of um, development away from satire from the early 18th century to the, to the later 18th century. Um, as you can probably tell, I'm much more in sympathy with the strong Swiftian, Spencian satire and tend to feel that um, there is a place for that. Um, I, I, I don't think that that precludes um, measured um, uh, uh, exposition of one's positions and one, one's arguments, which is what Spence does in most of his works. Um, he does have these extraordinarily strong satiric passages. And I think that they, I think what you're pointing to is the way that that indignation sustains the argument. I mean, it, it gives it a kind of force. Um, but uh, I think that the two can, can work hand in hand. I, 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 I don't know whether um, feminism is particularly averse to satire. I, I think that it's, it's actually interesting that just in terms of um, uh, performers who, who are satiric, um, um, political uh, commentators, 
and uh, so on. I mean, there has been uh, much more of an entrance of women's voices and feminist voices in, in that medium um, in the last generation. Um, but I take it as a sign of the strength of the opposition to the unjust um, institutions that, 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 that is the, the, the intensity of the indignation of the satire. Yeah, I do. So I take it that in the middle of the 19th century, the period that I characterize as, as one in which satire is suppressed or disciplined, although it appears episodically in say Dickens late novels and in other novels, um, I, I think that that's, that's one, uh, there, there's a kind of quietism there that, um, that I'm not uh, particularly drawn to. Thank you. We, we've got a, 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 a lot of appreciation, uh, Frank, in the chat. I'll, I'll forward it on to you. Uh, okay. A question from Chris Parry. It was interesting to hear about some of the parallels between Spence and Morris's thought. Is there any evidence that Morris read or consciously drew upon any of Spence's work? Great question. I haven't researched that yet. Uh, I need to. Um, I think that spent that Morris was obviously widely, widely, widely read, and um, I, it would not surprise me at all if he was uh, explicitly. Uh, I mean, you know, directly acquainted with Spence, but he's certainly acquainted with the with the tradition. And um, so I think that whether he was or not, the parallels are interesting, perhaps even more interesting if he wasn't directly <laughs> acquainted with Spence. Okay, we, um, I've got uh, a comment from Dick Holstock, who uh, as a folk singer is going to uh, is also is, is also in the States, although um, in California, I believe, and he is going to be Ooh, um, giving us, a, uh, yeah, isn't it? He's going to be giving us a talk uh, uh, in the spring, we hope, uh, um, on broadside ballads. And he Great. says that he's interested in broadside ballads of the period that were authored by Spence. So he'd like to get in touch with you. So if, if can, I, can I put you in touch with each other? Can yes, I have both yes. of your contact details? Great. Yes. Okay. Can you do that, please? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the comment. Um, and I have more comments here, which I can read out. But has anybody got a question they would like to pose or anything specific? I can see Dave Cope there, and I'm sure he would like, as a mere bookseller, uh, to, <laughs> if I may quote. Sorry, to, sorry uh, about that. Those yes, I know. His words. <laughs> I know. I, 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 it made me smile seeing who was in the audience. But yes, it, um, Dave, you don't have to comment. It's all right. Um, anybody, I will read out some of the things so that in case you, put, you can't see the chat. Uh, no, Dave would like to comment there. I've, I've, I've pushed him into action sorry Dave go on do unmute yourself okay well thanks very much for the talk um interesting he's very fascinating character I do wonder about uh Spence I mean I, th I think he obviously had some sort of personality disorder um like, I mean sh shown in his uh, his dispute with his great mate Thomas Buick you know who he engaged in a fight because Buick disagreed with him um and I, I, I suspect he's not, he wasn't a very funny person, just mm. the same as Richard Carlyle in some ways. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I think they similar. were so serious minded and obsessive about their ideas that um, they would have made fascinating company, but possibly, possibly not very amusing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. I agree. Um, I think that um one of the one of the comments that i've sometimes um received when i've presented on satire is um that that people remark on the way that some of the satire that i'm interested in uh, some of the radical political satire is not funny and it's true uh it's not um but i think that it's very strongly satiric in fact i think that there is there's a brand of satire, kind of Swiftian satire, or we could say Spencian satire, um, that um, veers more toward the tragic 
um, than the comic. And I certainly agree with you about Spence, the difficulty of Spence's character. He must have been an extraordinarily difficult uh, man. The, the, the intensity of his dedication to his central idea is both admirable, but, but also somewhat, you know, um, disturbing in, in some ways, right? Because it, it, it just seems to, to, to um, occupy his whole, his whole self. Um, and, and as you said, he, he, he doesn't uh, tolerate um, differences very well. Um, so I, I don't differ with you about um, your, your, your sense of what Spence as a, as a character would have been like. Um, but I do find the work to be um, e extraordinarily strong. You know, and and I think that that's one of the things that that just drew me to it is that uh, I had seen you know brief accounts of Spence before uh, I entered on reading him, and then in reading the work, um, uh, I, I was just struck by how uh, how effective I thought that the that the satire was, how rich, how deep it is, you know, with the the different cultural. Uh, resonances, the different techniques. I mean, he's really a very accomplished rhetorician, you know. So there, are, there are the the character traits of dogmatism and obsession, but but there are also these um, uh, rhetorical accomplishments that that I think are important. Thanks, uh, Mark Martin uh, Wright uh, adds that Sydney Webb adopted the idea of using the parish as the unit of land administration in his pamphlet, Practical Land Nationalization, he thinks in the early 1890s. Okay, great, uh, thank you. I, 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 will, I will send you the things in the chat, so um, we always have a good knowledgeable audience, it's, uh, it's great. Um, Tim asks, could you say more about the audience and circulation of his work? And can we say that Spence was shocking if he only wrote for an audience that would have agreed with him? Those are good questions. I mean, the, the question is, um, with satire is, is, a, um, is a very long standing question. Swift says that satire is a sort of ball that everyone strikes from themselves. Uh, to somebody else, right? So that it never affects them. Um, was he only read by people who agreed with him? Uh, perhaps. Um, he was certainly prosecuted a number of times, and he spent um, a fair amount of time in jail, once for having been convicted of sedition and once um, for the accusation of, of being uh, treasonous, um, although he never came to trial for that one. So altogether, he spent maybe two uh, years in jail. Um, somebody was reading him. Um, and I think that even if um, it was mostly working men, I don't think that we can assume that before they read him, they agreed with everything that he said. I think that he's trying to convince other working men, landowners, if, if they're willing to read him and listen to him, but he's interested in convincing them that there is another way. And he's got that, you know, he's got that vision that he never wavers from. And so um, I, I don't know how effective he is. I mean, we could, we could argue about how effective any utopian is um, and any satirist. Um, I find both forms to be necessary and vivifying. Um, but that's me, and uh, and a lot of people don't share my um, my proclivity toward for that. But um, but but I think that he did have some effect, and um, I think that the you know you could even look at the formation of the. I mean, he he never retracts or retreats from that that vision that he had back you know back in the 1770s, and when he does come back in the 18 teens uh, in the last couple of years of his life, he's publishing another periodical that expresses the same 
position, and he gathers a circle of followers around him who are the violent Spencians, who don't accomplish anything more than he did, um, although he confined himself to the use of uh, the written word, the published word. Um, the, the violent Spencians, you know, engage in a kind of uh, revolution or, or um, attempted um, uh, rebellion and um, bring down upon themselves, you know, uh, all of the, the, the power of the state, um, which he managed, you know, to, to survive himself. But uh, so, so I'd say that, yeah, I think that he does have some effect. Um, it's always hard to predict what kind of effect any writer is going to have, I think. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Um, vivifying is a great word. Um, thank you for that. I think that's the first time we've had vivifying in, in however many uh, talks we're now on. But actually, all, all of our speakers uh, do find their subjects vivifying and really put that across in, a, in, a, in an effective and, uh, and passionate way. And, and we thank you for, for following in that tradition. Has anybody got any last thing they want to, to say to me? Wave at me if you want to. No, I think you have uh answered answered people's inquiries and dealt with their comments and uh frank thank you so much it is um yeah a, uh, a a a time of day that we would not expect to be joined by someone from miami so we really do particularly appreciate that but but also your topic and as i say your 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 expertise so thank you very much uh indeed my appreciation to all of you thanks so if you joined us late, folks, or if you want to recommend this talk to others, it has been recorded and we'll be uploading it shortly to the library's YouTube channel with an event with the event web page providing a link to it. And next week's talk is again online only. On Wednesday, the 13th of October at 2 p.m., Amy Todd will speak to us about the Peckham Publishing Project, one of the many groups that made up the Federation of Worker, Writer and Community Publishers in the 1980s. Till then, best wishes to you all in solidarity from all at the Working Class Movement Library. Goodbye. Bye bye.